Welcome to another fabulous ILA Yes webinar. Today, we have the honor of presenting Genevieve Rambier and Honor Coleman. Genevieve is a practicing clinical neuropsychologist at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne and lecturer in the neuropsychology at the University of Melbourne. As a clinician scientist, she balances her clinical and academic work with her new role as a senior research fellow in a world leading epilepsy research genetics group at the Epilepsy Genetics Research Program with Sam Berkovic and Ingrid Sheffer. Her program of research aims to explore the neurobiological and psychological underpinnings of mood and cognitive disorders in epilepsy and other neurological conditions. Using beha behavioral neuroimaging and genetics methodologies. Genevieve is a member of the Next Generation Task Force in the International League Against Epilepsy, ILA, a founding member and secretary of the ILA Young Epilepsy Section, yes, and a member of the Research and Training Subcommittee of the Epilepsy Society of Australia. She is also a YES representative for the 13th Asian and Oceanic Epilepsy Congress Organizing Committee. Honor is a clinical neuropsychologist at Alfred Health and the current chair of the Young Epilepsy Section Committee of the Epilepsy Society of Australia. Her research and clinical work focuses on the psychosocial comorbidities of epilepsy and on the impact of undergoing epilepsy surgery on cognition and psychosocial functioning. Clinically, Honor also works with patients who have epilepsy and comorbid mood disorders and patients with functional neurological disorders. We welcome both to this webinar. Today's learning objectives are demonstrate the ability to recognize and manage the special needs of persons with epilepsy. Without further ado, I leave you with both Genevieve and Honor. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Manuela. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Manuela. And thank you to the Young Epilepsy Section um, webinar team for the invitation to Honor and I to present today. Um, psychosocial care of people with epilepsy is a topic that's really close to both Honor and I's heart. Um, and so today we wanted to take you through the rationale of why we provide a psychosocial um, service to people with epilepsy and how we go about doing that practice. Sorry. Um, so I just wanted to start, um, Honor and myself are dialing in from Australia today and we just wanted to acknowledge that we're streaming today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people in uh, Melbourne and that we'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're streaming from today. So as Manuela has already um, very eloquently um, relayed, um, I um, balance clinical um, research and lecturing work um, in the field of neuropsychology with a particular interest on the care of people with epilepsy and how we go about um, uh, addressing the psychosocial, cognitive and behavioural needs of people with epilepsy. Thanks, Jen. Um, and yeah, again, thank you for the lovely introduction um, uh, and for the invite from the YES group to present. Um, very similar to Jen, I also work uh, in clinical neuropsychology um, and focusing on the sort of psychosocial and mood comorbidities uh, of people living with epilepsy and um, how we can, we're sort of taking a systems approach today to look at how we can kind of um, focus on holistic care uh, for people living with epilepsy. So what is a systems care um, approach to care in epilepsy? So um, I wanted to frame today's um, webinar um, to give some insight about why we think it's important to take a psycho psychosocial approach to epilepsy care through the lens of um, quality of life and the disability paradox. So quality of life was a, a, a concept developed only really in the 1940s in cancer research 
as a way to capture the impact of a disease and its treatment on a person's well-being. So traditionally, the way um, medical outcomes were measured was um, by symptom remission um, or, or other biomedical markers of treatment response. Um, but the work of Karnofsky and others in the 1940s um, really brought to the fore this concept that, um, that a disease has wide-ranging impacts beyond the symptomatology uh, on, on, on how we live and work and, and, and enjoy our lives. And so he developed a quality of life as a measurement to gauge how the disease and its treatment impacts um, the person holistically as a whole. Um, and an interesting um, point to emerge from a lot of quality of life research was that um, there was this assumption that illness and disease had significant impacts on people's quality of life and that disability in particular and, 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 and your living conditions would have a massive impact on your sense of how well you were living your life and, and your quality of life at that moment. Um, however, a real challenge to this assumption emerged when um, global studies of quality of life were conducted and it emerged that across people with very different standards of living, there was a broad homeostasis in their quality of life or a set point um, to it. So as you can see in this graph, um, across um, the uh, global surveys of quality of life, there was a real median um, in the world of around 70 out of 100. So most people think that they're doing better than average in terms of their quality of life and with pretty small standard deviations. And when you look at um, the global whole of people and how they rate their quality of life compared to people from developing countries, there's really not a really big difference. So people from Western worlds who have the benefits of um, higher socioeconomic resources, access to care, um, greater wealth, um, report only incrementally higher well-being than people from developing nations or from situations that um, we might objectively consider to be quite stressful. So it suggests that quality of life is generally held at around the 70 to 75 percent mark across a wide range of psychosocial conditions. And really interestingly, injury and illness doesn't automatically decrease quality of life. So what we see is that after someone incurs a major injury or gets a major diagnosis of epilepsy, for instance, that in the 12 to 24 months after that diagnosis, their self-rated quality of life will dip. But after around the two-year mark of having the injury or the diagnosis, it tends to bounce back to that homeostatic set point of about 75 for most people. So this would suggest to us that despite ongoing medical problems of physical disability, that um, over the long term of somebody's life, quality of life tends to be um, not as um, hugely diminished by physical disability than we originally thought. And so this really raises the concept, okay, well, if illness and injury per se aren't having a permanent increase on people's well-being and quality of life, those physical symptoms like seizures and, and the like that people seem to adjust to, what is it that causes the diminished quality of life that is so often caused, that is so often reported by our patients with epilepsy? And so to that, we look to the psychosocial research and um, work by Fisher and others since the 1980s and onwards has consistently shown that people with epilepsy report the primary problem um, of seizures to be less of an impact on their quality of life than things like a diminished ability to drive, psychosocial restrictions and mental health difficulties. 
And so the key concepts that Honor and I wanted to convey today is that there are multiple determinants of health and healthcare outcomes. And seizure frequency and seizure burden is only one. It's a very important outcome, obviously, but it's only one of many important outcomes in how we determine the impact of a disease on someone's well-being and quality of life. Um, there are multiple elements that are involved in caring for people with epilepsy, and these are resourcing and people-wide problems um, in terms of the level of service that we're able to provide people based on our healthcare systems and our qualifications. But there's also broader socio-political constraints to the care that we can provide people with epilepsy as well. A psychosocial approach to epilepsy care really challenges us to develop new ways of treating people with epilepsy that are holistic, that are focused, that are expanded beyond just looking at seizure outcome, at the multiple ways that epilepsy can impact someone's life. It's strengths focused, what the person with epilepsy is good at and what they value doing, and it's health promoting. And taking a psychosocial approach, we will argue, can have major health economics implications as well. So to take a view of um, the World Health Organization and its view of disability, um, they, in 2002, their World Health Organization developed a framework for measuring health and disability in individuals and broader disease populations. And in particular, it it, it shifted the emphasis from disability and what people can't do to what people can do and health. Um, the reason being that everyone at some point in their lives will probably experience some level of disability and rather than um, focusing on that narrowly, conceptualising people from a strengths perspective. Um, by doing this, it mainstreams the experience of disability and it also takes into account social and psychosocial aspects of epilepsy and other diseases and, um, and, and changes the viewpoint from it being exclusively a medical problem. Um, so this um, framework from World Health Organisation describes changes in body structure and function and particularly focuses on the person's level of capacity what they can do in a standard environment and their level of performance. So what they can do in their usual environment. So determining what the person is able to do and what they would like to do, focusing on what they can't do. So for instance, in the case of epilepsy, rather than focusing on the fact that they can't drive, trying to shift our thinking to, well, what does the person want to do with driving and how can we support them to do those activities even if they don't have a license? Um, it takes into consideration all bodily functions and as well as what the barriers to that participation might be. So it's a, it, the World Health, this, this framework provides a neat little model for us to use in how we conceptualise epilepsy and the impact it can have on people's participation in life. Um, in particular, it views the disability as a feature of the person. So, and this is again um, reflected in the shift in recent years from referring to um, epileptics to people with epilepsy. So we're not defining the person by their illness, they're just a person that has epilepsy. Um, we also consider epilepsy as a socially created problem and that the barriers to participation for people with epilepsy are in some way created by our social barriers and that these demand a political response to overcome. And we'll go into this and what that might look like later on. That there are social attitudes, stigma, barriers and, and, and legal barriers that might impact on, on the person with epilepsy and their ability to participate. For instance, geographically living in quite a remote or rural um, part of your country, um, if you can't drive, might mean you're more likely to be socially isolated than someone who has the benefit of living close to good public transport. And then there are personal factors that implicate to what extent a person with epilepsy is limited by their disease. This can be gender, age, whether they're children or elderly in particular, their beliefs around epilepsy and the cultural beliefs around epilepsy, and then their personal resources like um, their um, resilience and their pre-existing coping style. 
And importantly, sorry, that last point, um, their socioeconomic status, so the um, the financial resources that they have to um, engage and participate in the world that they want in a way that they want to and, um, and, and addressing and, and being able to access the medical treatment that they're prescribed. Um, so using this framework, disability in the context of epilepsy could include impairments being seizures, but also cognitive impairments, mood impairments, um, activity limitations that we often see in people with epilepsy might be poor attendance at school and appointments um, and the like. Um, there are often restrictions on their participation in the world. So um, they might have to take time out of work to recover from seizures. They might not be able to um, engage in certain jobs like driving buses and planes or working as a roofing tiler. They encounter stigma that might preclude them from getting involved in activities they like. And in, in psychosocial functioning in epilepsy is akin to what the World Health Organization is calling participation. So that's really what we're focusing on today, the barriers to participation for people with epilepsy. And this, as research shows, has a major impact on quality of life. And what Honor and I want to demonstrate today is that rehabilitation programs that are focused on improving the psychosocial participation of people with epilepsy are achievable and they have major impacts on people's quality of life in improving their participation in the world. So I just wanted to do a very quick case study to orient you to how um, epilepsy can limit participation in quite surprising ways. So very briefly, um, the woman that I thought was illustrative of this participation barrier was a 30-year-old woman. She was highly educated. She had numerous degrees, including a master's degree in law. Um, despite this, she was unemployed. And in fact, her parents were very well-known um, um, people in the Melbourne community, in the legal community. Um, they were very well-connected. And um, they had offered her through their connections, numerous internships at prestigious law firms, and she'd done them, but never really capitalized on those opportunities. She'd had chronic temporal lobe epilepsy since a teenager. And since the diagnosis, she'd suffered numerous episodes of low mood, anxiety, and um, relevant to what Anna's gonna talk about, low self-esteem related to the epilepsy and the embarrassment of having seizures. Her goal for, so she was offered a right anterior temporal lobe lobectomy and her goal for surgery was to get a job, find a boyfriend, get married and just do all the normal stuff that she felt epilepsy was precluding her from doing. And she was rendered seizure free from the surgery. Now, um, what we might expect is once the seizures had remitted and what this patient expected was that that the seizures themselves were the major barrier to her participating in life and that this was what was holding her back from getting a job, from meeting a nice guy, from getting married. But what actually ended up happening was that after surgery, she had a rough recovery. The bone flap got infected. She had ongoing headaches and other sort of psychos and other somatic symptoms. Um, she was offered numerous opportunities to seek work through her family connections. And there was always a reason why she couldn't do it. And in fact, we got the sense Mom, that she was. We are, we are, we I'm some, sorry, one moment. We some, we some oh, Might just um, similar to so just to sort of take over from from what Jen was saying. Um, it is very common. So there's a lot of um, research in the literature looking into this phenomenon um, referred to as the burden of normality of that sort of a difficult adjustment to suddenly being well and sort of having the seizures removed doesn't automatically um, sort of then allow that person to, as she was hoping, get a job or find a boyfriend, mm. um, get married and all the normal stuff. And, in fact, that diagnosis of, and sorry about that, in fact, that diagnosis of epilepsy and the implications that had on her self-confidence, her self-belief, really lingered even when the seizures were no longer present. So really illustrating, I think, the lingering disability that epilepsy can have even when the physical symptoms of seizures are controlled. Yeah, and I think, um, so sort of taking on from that, so the models that Jen has presented um, so far, looking at the um, World Health Organization's 
conceptualization of disability and health. Um, a lot of that, so we've sort of covered a lot of this already, but I just wanted to show, so this model um, was developed by Care at All in 2011 from a wealth of qualitative literature. So um, they were looking at a lot of studies that have spoken to people with epilepsy, trying to connect and trying to sort of piece together all of these psychosocial experiences and how they connect. Um, and as you can see here, it's quite complicated. Um, and there's a lot of um, interconnections and interdependence between a lot of these experiences. So very similar to um, what Jen's been talking about, for example, driving is obviously a big issue, um, which is up in the top right um, as an external barrier to participation. Um, driving then obviously connects to jobs and to uh, vocational opportunities. If you're unable to drive, um, often a lot of jobs are off the table. Um, as well as other, um, as we were talking about before, there's that experience of stigma, which can impact um, sort of future hopes and concerns about potential jobs. Um, things like sort of driving uh, and uh, vocational barriers impact financial independence um, and then a person's sense of autonomy um, and self-efficacy. So there's a lot of um, interconnections. When we talk about psychosocial functioning, um, it is quite a, a complex um, construct in a way. It's that interaction between these psychological constructs such as self-esteem, uh, mood, well-being, um, as well as these social social functioning, so working, driving, um, social networks. Um, and this second model is a, a very nice one, uh, a bit more recently done by Scott uh, and colleagues here in Australia in 2018. Um, and they were looking particularly at uh, trying to put together a model of um, anxiety and epilepsy and how anxiety uh, relates to seizures. Um, and so you can sort of see here that um, some of the background factors that might impact a person's uh, reaction to seizures were things like um, their stage of development, so their um, life stage, age, understanding of epilepsy, as well as their psychiatric history uh, and their ability to tolerate uh, uncertainty or to tolerate that unpredictability of seizures, um, as well as external factors, so social support um, and social modelling, potentially how the family responds to their diagnosis of epilepsy and their seizures. Um, so those are just sort of pre-existing factors that may or may not help someone buffer how they cope with their diagnosis. Um, and then sort of once the epilepsy has come on and then um, how they cope with their seizures can impact their psychosocial functioning further. So you can see here from the coping appraisal, so that refers to how, how they um, appraise or how they interpret the threat um, of their seizures. So if they feel like the seizures are beyond their ability to cope or a, a massive threat to their well-being, or if they feel like they can take their seizures in their stride and it's not um, disrupting sort of normal life too much. Um, so if they've got a high coping appraisal and they feel like they can manage and they can cope well, they take appropriate caution so, you know, managing the risk appropriately, um, but then they're still able to engage in different roles, still able to make the most um, of, as Genevieve was talking about before, using public transport, finding ways around their restrictions so they can still work and socialise, um, which then promotes uh, psychological well-being. Um, if they have a low coping appraisal, so if they feel like the seizures are beyond their control um, or, or too much of a, a threat or a risk, um, then they might um, sort of engage in what's called excessive avoidance. So not going out very much, um, not seeing people for fear of um, stigma potentially or for fear of other people's reaction, fear of having a seizure in public, that sort of thing. Um, and as you can see here, then that leads to potentially unnecessary reduction in role functioning and ongoing anxiety. Um, and as part of that, the flow on effect then, so role functioning and kind of engaging in, in social, with social groups or in different uh, vocational roles, different jobs, is a really important part of developing um, our identity and our sense of self. So the less and less sort of diverse 
social opportunity someone has, the less developed their identity or their sense of self. So these things are all connected, um, but we've gone with, so for the rest of, of the talk, we're going with a nice sort of biopsychosocial model, which tries to simplify a lot of these factors. Um, so <coughs> for this model, we've got the person with epilepsy uh, at the heart of it. Um, we then obviously do need to consider, as with the WHO model, the biological factors. So that might be, um, their, obviously their epilepsy, whether it's acute or chronic, uh, focal or generalized, the severity and frequency of seizures, as well as other comorbidities uh, and medication. Um, how that then interacts with their psychological well-being, so both neuropsychological in terms of their cognition uh, and ability to understand their seizures and also their cognitive um, reserve, I guess, or, or their broader um, cogn cognitive functioning, um, as well as other psychological factors. So as we were just talking about self-esteem, identity, personality, um, mood and behaviour. We won't be focusing very much on sort of mood or psychiatric factors specifically, uh, because I think um, Andy Canner and, and other webinars have, have done a lot of great um, uh, work on, on that, those factors more specifically. Uh, and then the last aspect of the model is the social aspect. So again, as we were talking about before, socioeconomic status, family dynamics, uh, education, vocation, uh, social network. So this is a really nice kind of simple model just to remember uh, or to kind of bear in mind, I think when working with patients with epilepsy, that it's not just the biological, it's not just um, that sort of sphere that we're, that we're working with, it really is for the person, there's a lot of other factors that are interacting. Um, and I think uh, some recent work um, coming from Jen's lab that has focused on this is looking at epilepsy and body image in particular. So body image is this multi-dimensional construct referring to how we uh, appraise or how we view our physical appearance and our body. And sometimes that can lead to dissatisfaction with body image, which is sort of negative distortions or negative perceptions of our body uh, and what we feel like. Um, and this is something that I'm sure with, um, for, for people working with patients with epilepsy or people with epilepsy is something that you would see a lot in the clinic in terms of um, hesitation around uh, medication increases or medication changes. If it might bring on weight gain, um, concern about if, you know, I know um, patients who have gone in for surgery are often concerned about how much of their hair might be shaved uh, for the surgery or what that means for them. And, you know, these might seem, um, hopefully not, but sometimes these might seem like trivial concerns, but in fact it is a really important um, thing to talk about because it sort of reflects this broader biopsychosocial model and these broader factors. So, for example, uh, and I think this is a really nice illustration of it, but from the biological side of things, um, anti-epileptic drugs can obviously have a range of physical changes to the body, including weight gain, um, hirsutism, so increased um, hairiness, rash, um, hair loss for some patients, all these sort of physical uh, or physiological side effects, um, which then um, can interact with someone's social behaviour. So if they're sort of um, feeling more self-conscious or, or feeling uh, embarrassed, they might um, refrain from socialising as much. Social factors can also have a bi-directional uh, um, impact. So for example, if families are really anxious about the person having a seizure, then they might sort of um, not be very keen on them exercising uh, or engaging in sort of um, sports activities and things where they might be more at risk. So then there's increased weight gain from the seizures and not very much exercise because of that um, sort of worry about sports and, and various engagements, which then obviously has an impact on the person's psychological functioning and on their body image uh, and on their mood and quality of life with all these sort of factors. And then sort of, as we know, poor mood can also impact factors such as seizure frequency, medication adherence, uh, and so on. And so it kind of goes around um, in a bit of a cycle. Um, and one of our uh, master's students recently did a, 
uh, project on this to look at the interaction between um, body image and quality of life. Um, and what she found was that, um, as we know, depression uh, predicted quality of life. That's a very well established uh, connection. Um, but in actual fact, body area satisfaction or a marker of body image dissatisfaction uh, actually predicted poor quality of life more strongly uh, in the cohort that we were looking at. So it is, you know, as we we're talking about before, if patients have concerns about weight gain or changes due to side effects of medication, uh, it is actually a really important factor to discuss with them uh, because it can have a significant impact on quality of life and well-being. Um, so then looking beyond, so that's the person with epilepsy and these their own individual biopsychosocial factors. Um, and now Jen's going to be talking about the broader systems that they sit in. Yeah, so I just wanted to orient um, you to some of our thinking around how these broader so social systems influence our care of people with epilepsy. Um, and then we'll lead into some discussion about what a psychosocial rehabilitation program looks like in an epilepsy service to address all these interacting factors that Honor um, has already raised. So the next level, I guess, outside the person with epilepsy and the immediate impact of the seizures, the psychological and the cognitive and the social impacts of epilepsy is the, the impact on the broader family unit. So I think that anyone that is practicing with people with epilepsy um, knows that epilepsy is really a family experience. This can be especially acute in paediatric populations, of course, where um, the family is intimately involved in the care of person with epilepsy. But both Honor and I are adult um, epilepsy neuropsychologists, and um, we've seen firsthand, um, as I'm sure most of you have, how epilepsy can really impact the entire family. Um, epilepsy confers a number of stressors on the family, um, if someone can't drive or can't work, for instance, it imposes additional um, caregiving burdens on other family members, be they spouses, ageing parents, to care for, to ferry the person with epilepsy around, um, to provide for them financially. And most of the time, of course, our families with epilepsy don't mind this. You know, they're, they're more than happy to do it. But it cre can create in the person with epilepsy a sense of burden, even if the family, um, you know, doesn't, doesn't agree with that perception themselves. And in this way, epilepsy can become the organising principle of family life. Um, you know, the, the major coordination that goes into who's going to drive so-and-so where, who's going to pick up the kids. Um, if you're not working at the moment, maybe you can be the caregiver. It's a constant negotiation that centres around epilepsy and the barriers to participation that epilepsy can present. And these... This, this stress that epilepsy can impose in some families can alter the emotional closeness between family members. And this led to a, I think it's a pretty cool study that we've been doing in people and families with epilepsy that's currently under review. So um, a bit of a sneak preview. Um, so my um, old PhD and honours PhD supervisor, Sarah Wilson, who has a long track record in this space of psychosocial care of people with epilepsy, devised this computer software program for research purposes that, can, that allows us to map how epilepsy impacts on people's families. So what we ask our participants to do is to create a little avatar for each person in their family and give them a name and whether they're big or small. And then they can indicate how well supported um, that person is of, of them and their epilepsy. And then we get patients, participants, um, the person with epilepsy and their family members to create these family maps. So indicating in a graphical sense how close and supported they feel by each person in their family. So the closer they are on this target, the closer and more strongly supported they feel um, by that family member. And this is based on a very well-known um, social therapy technique called the Kvaibek family sculpture technique, but updated for computer programs. And when we looked at all these family maps that we connect, collected, three clear patterns of family functioning in epilepsy um, emerged. 
And these were families characterized by extremely close family functioning, sort of more moderate closeness. And then on the far right, quite fractured or disparate family functioning. Um, and, and, and we labeled these extremely close, close and fractured families with epilepsy. Um, and these, by the way, are all adults with epilepsy and their families. So, um, oops, one thing I will mention, when we looked at these families, the first thing we thought was that this extremely close family seemed, as a psychologist, seemed too close. So um, there's a concept, I guess, in psychology called enmeshment, whereby when family members are overly involved in each other's lives, it can really stifle personal autonomy and personal development and can lead to quite significant feelings of tension. However, when we looked at these three family patterns in our families with epilepsy, what emerged was that these people in the extremely close families actually found that um, exceptionally close family bonding to be therapeutic. They felt more supported. They felt more able to communicate about their epilepsy to their family. And as we'll see, it had really good mental health outcomes. Um, in converse, these fractured families reported very maladaptive family behaviours. So people from these fractured families typically reported feeling um, disconnected, disengaged from family members. They felt like their family was very rigid. They weren't close and cohesive. And there was no sense of real family support around their epilepsy. Now, the majority of people with epilepsy reported being from um, these close families. Um, so that was the predominant um, phenotype of the families, followed by there was a good number of extremely close families, which was pleasing to see, given that they seem to have very healthy family dynamics. And happily, the, the, the fractured dynamics were um, the minority. So less than 20% of our epilepsy families were fractured. When we looked at how epilepsy shapes these family typologies, a really interesting pattern emerged. So in particular, when we look at the onset of epilepsy in adolescence and adulthood, the majority of these families report the sort of moderate close family dynamics. <clears throat> when we look at the childhood onset epilepsies, there's this splitting that occurs in the group. So people, adults that had child on epilepsy that emerged in childhood, were almost exclusively reporting extremely close family dynamics or high levels of fractured family dynamics. So to us, this suggested that the onset of epilepsy in that formative childhood years had this make or break impact on family dynamics where the stress of um, the onset of epilepsy either brought the families close together or it drove them apart in some cases. To us, suggesting that the onset of epilepsy in childhood is a critical um, junction in the epilepsy lifespan to intervene in family support so that these people can then feel, um, have the benefit of those therapeutic close family dynamics um, over the long term. The other really interesting thing I think to emerge from this research was that, as I've alluded to earlier, um, the extremely close families here in Teal had the best psychological outcomes for people with epilepsy. So these were psychologically protective family dynamics for people with epilepsy to be that really overly, we thought overly close, but actually very supportive families. Um, these patients had the lowest levels of depression and anxiety, significantly so. And when we look at their quality of whoa, when we look at their quality of life, they have far higher quality of life than people from fractured families or people from close families. I thought it was really interesting too that it wasn't significant, but for some people, having a fractured family was actually better for quality of life than being from a close family. And you know, I thought about why this might be, and I think potentially that for some people families can be toxic. And we do have some patients in the cohort 
who the family was very unsupportive of their epilepsy. So for these patients to be fractured, to be physically away from their family was actually a good thing for their mental health um, because some of these families were very stigmatising towards the epilepsy. Um, they viewed the person with epilepsy as a burden or um, as being abnormal or, you know, very sick, um, very unhelpful thinking around the epilepsy. So for a minority of these fractures, Fractured families being um, psychologically separated from their immediate family was actually kind of um, an adaptive um, mechanism for them. And so family-centred care in epilepsy, we see this in epilepsy and it's reflected in other literatures like the cancer literature as well, that the onset of epilepsy um, or a, a disease in childhood really um, has the potential to draw the family together and bond them and that this extreme family closeness is advantageous to our people with epilepsy. And as I say, that, that here the family system is an opportunity for intervention that is ripe for picking. And, in fact, there are some interventions out there. The Fafin um, 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 paper I've listed there at the bottom and Hageman um, are both um, pilot studies of low-cost family interventions for um, low resource um, epilepsy centres for delivering better psychological and psychosocial support to our families with epilepsy. So if you work in paediatrics, that might be a good resource um, for you. Um, and just a final point um, that when we do do our psychosocial interventions, you know, we often get the family involved in all the discussions. I work in surgery particularly, so we, I like to get the families in the room so everyone has all the information and they can make a decision as a family. And to understand their response to epilepsy and its treatment, I found it's really important we need to understand how the family views epilepsy. What are their cultural beliefs around it? Uh, do they stigmatise epilepsy? Do they have a poor understanding of epilepsy and its biology? What, are the, what, what language do they use to describe the epilepsy and its impact? And I try to reflect that language in my, in my interventions and my psychoeducation with the families. And I always consider, too, their socioeconomic resources and try and use our connections with social workers or um, in Australia we have the benefit of a, a national disability scheme trying to link our, our less well-resourced families in um, with community-based resources to support them to avoid that fracturing that we might otherwise see. Um, I just wanted to finish up before we go into the final section on, on how we deliver our care with people with epilepsy is to um, acknowledge the political considerations in our care with people with epilepsy. So Honor and I are conscious that we're presenting from Australia and that we not only have the benefit of very good free public health in Australia, um, but that we have exceptional, for a pretty small country, we have pretty good epilepsy care, I would say. Um, by a number of historical factors as to why. And, um, but we acknowledge that um, that is probably the, not the case for a lot of places around the world. So while we talk about focusing on the clinical health at an individual level um, today, um, we acknowledge that the way that we practice and the way other people practice is gonna be um, influenced by population level resources um, what the healthcare system looks like, what public policy is around um, funding research and funding epilepsy care um, in different areas of the world. <clears throat> and the, the role of health advocacy. So it's nice, I think Manuela is, is advocate, is, is moderating today because this I know is an area um, passionate to yourself in that um, as epilepsy clinicians, we often have to advocate for our patients um, and our, our people with epilepsy um, so that all our patients have equitable access to the resources that we have available to us. So it might mean that, you know, a, a patient that's a single mother um, might have difficulty getting to appointments. Um, so how can we modify our, you know, can we offer her telehealth so that we can give her the same level of care as we can our other patients? Um, some of our LGBTQI um, patients in the past have felt uncomfortable um, sometimes with um, epilepsy. They have felt not well represented in epilepsy care. 
And I think the ILAE is increasingly recognising at a global level that there are massive discrepancies in that the access to care that some people enjoy in countries like Australia um, and in parts of Europe and other parts of the world uh, compared to in um, less socioeconomically resourced countries. Um, so I know Manuela and others are doing a lot trying to um, expand resources that are available to Indigenous or to, to um, other low economic or, or less um, resourced um, communities in the world. And the ILAE is making um, gains as an organisation to do this as well. So um, <clears throat> thanks to our colleague Neha Call for providing some of this information. But um, the Ep International League Against Epilepsy has recently formed a council, a global advocacy council, for um, these exact political issues of advocating for people with epilepsy at a global level and excitingly liaising with the World Health Organization um, to develop an intersectoral global action plan for epilepsy and um, epilepsy as a gateway to other neurological disorders and really acknowledging the treatment gap that exists across the globe in epilepsy care and also access to um, reliable, to, um, to, to good quality um, and affordable epilepsy treatments. <clears throat> Um, and so to conclude, Honor and I, um, now we've outlaid, I guess, um, the, the way, the model in which we practice in our psychosocial care of people with epilepsy, the sorts of things that we consider when we're formulating with a patient, what does this patient, what, how does this person want to participate in the world? And what are the barriers to that from an epilepsy point of view, be they biological, social, cognitive, or psychological? Uh, thanks Jen and yeah so just to kind of we've now yeah having outlined the model of, of what are all these different factors that impact the person how can we then use those sort of factors or use that model to guide our treatment approach and to guide our models of care uh, so again looking to the World Health Organization's framework um, promoting psychosocial adjustment, particularly um, with a focus on epilepsy here, uh, it really is about that trying to return to a productive lifestyle. So whether or not it's been from an altered developmental trajectory from early onset epilepsy uh, or returning to uh, that productive lifestyle as an adult, if it's sort of suddenly been disrailed or they've sort of suddenly had this uh, later onset epilepsy, which is... Um, cause disruption to, to their current lifestyle. Um, so obviously, you know, all these barriers to engagement in a productive lifestyle, such as decreased employment, uh, decreased social contacts and leisure time has a significant impact on a person's mood uh, and sense of self. Um, so we know that decreased employment can lead to low self-esteem and low self-efficacy. Uh, depression uh, and increased anxiety uh, and poor success at work is also related to poor self-awareness um, and difficulties with cognition and metacognition um, and so you know that is certainly as Jen was saying we've got families is a an area that's sort of ripe for interventions um, also vocational outcomes and vocational rehabilitation uh, is another area that we can make a real difference in terms of patient psychosocial functioning um, because you know certainly um, for a number of people with epilepsy the research shows that there's actually a, a large sort of cohort or a large group who are underemployed so there's unemployed um, and out of work and there's full-time employed but there's actually a large group who are underemployed so they're not uh, which kind of refers to that not quite uh, reach their, their capacity I guess so they've got a lot of potential um, but they're sort of in a job that's not reflective of their level of education or their level of um, capabilities, uh, similar to the case that Jen presented before of, of this woman uh, with a law degree who was doing a number of internships but not finding full-time work. So, you know, people who have a lot of potential um, to sort of make vocational gains um, but may need some extra support or intervention um, to reach that Oh, uh, it can also be really important when we're talking about the social uh, aspects of epilepsy. Um, and we know, again, this is that um, importance of considering 
the biopsychosocial model. Uh, so for example, a number of um, epilepsy syndromes, we, there's more and more evidence emerging that there may be some social cognitive difficulties. So particularly, for example, uh, in our patients with temporal lobe epilepsy, uh, social cognition uh, is actually emerging as, a, as an area of interest. So how can we target that in order to improve social skills uh, and improve social relationships? Um, and similarly, again, to Jen's case, you know, I've had a number of patients. So a lot of my research was looking at the long-term outcomes of epilepsy surgery. And a number of patients would approach surgery with this hope of expanding social horizons, making new friends, dating more, um, you know, doing all of this uh, social exploration. Um, and even sort of 15 to 20 years later, um, a lot would sort of say to me, oh, I, you know, I, I think I'm just shy, or I guess I'm just not very good at, at small talk. You know, I, I don't really have a big social circle. Um, and at that point, you know, I think it had become similar to that homeostasis or equilibrium and quality of life. It was something that they were comfortable with, but it was obvious that surgery uh, and the reduction in seizures didn't automatically um, equate to this sudden social know-how. It mm -hmm. doesn't automatically bring about um, increased social skills. That's something that we might need to, um, uh, an area of intervention as well as leisure activities. So rehab, I think uh, both Jen and I have worked in rehab previously. So we felt that this was quite a good model of care um, and a, you know, a model that then reflects that biopsychosocial approach. So in rehab, you've got uh, two kind of broadly speaking, two approaches. So there's a multidisciplinary approach, which is typically physician uh, or doctor is the lead of the team, um, kind of guiding, um, the broader allied health team approach. So that's the more traditional model. Um, and then you've also got the interdisciplinary approach, which is a bit more of an egalitarian model and kind of harmonizes the links between disciplines. So, you know, that might be, as Jen was saying before, the neuropsychologists, the social workers, the occupational therapists or speech pathologists are working together, uh, everyone bringing their expertise to the table. Um, for to kind of guide the, um, the patient's goals or to help them achieve their goals. Um, so for, from an um, epilepsy perspective, here we are with our biopsychosocial approach again. So we can sort of see here's the team, you know, from a biological perspective, we might have the neurologists and the epileptologists, surgeons, radiologists, nurses, guiding medication choices, surgical options, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, social workers and our epilepsy nurses supporting the, the patient perhaps with applications for um, uh, broader services such as disability support schemes um, or providing support for the family and, and family members. Um, and then we've also got the psychological team, so the psychologist, neuropsychologist uh, and psychiatry fellows. So but all of the team obviously working together. Um, and I think as Jen was said before, the family uh, in rehab medicine is also considered actually a crucial part of the team. So it's really important not to have that team sort of formulate a plan and decide on what's best for the person, but to consider everyone within that broader framework as all working together um, in, term, in that model. Because if you've got the the person on board, obviously, um, but also the family on board as well. Um, you, there's much better treatment outcomes and, and much better um, support over the longer term. Um, so this is a, um, Jen might speak to this a little bit more, but this is a um, kind of using, I guess, a bit of that rehab model, um, but this is what some of our comprehensive epilepsy programs look like here in Melbourne mm -hmm. um, and considering the different roles uh, and the different team members uh, specifically here for post-surgical care. Mm. Yeah, so um, I know traditional rehab medicine is, um, you know, um, conceptualised as someone gets sick or injured and then it's rehabilitation after that. And we certainly do that in epilepsy um, after the diagnosis or when certain stressors arise. We can mobilise as a team in a multidisciplinary fashion to help that person achieve their goals in spite of their epilepsy. 
I, an interesting quirk, though, I guess, is in the care of around our patients with epilepsy, around epilepsy surgery. So in an inverse of the traditional model, we are supporting someone who has been chronically unwell and then suddenly becomes normal or um, is no longer burdened by their seizures. And so, again, our, um, old, our, our supervisor and mentor, Sarah, um, developed this really nice model back in her, her postdoc days, um, the burden of normality. So conceptualising that for some people, this transition from being chronically unwell to suddenly well and healthy and normal can take a lot of psychological and psychosocial adjustment to make that shift so that then they go on to maximise the benefits of being seizure free. So for instance, that earlier case study of the law um, graduate, um, she required a lot of work for her to be able to shed the sickness, the illness role that she had uh, really invested in over a lot of years, that she used the epilepsy as an excuse to shirk opportunities and to engage and, and to avoid, you know, the stress that comes with putting yourself out there dating or, or going to work. Um, and that required a lot of work to build her self-confidence and her skills to achieve those sorts of goals. So in our program, for instance, prior to surgery, we work very closely as a multidisciplinary team with the epileptologists. Um, I do the psychosocial and um, the neurocognitive aspects of um, predicting what the cognitive deficits might be, but also prepping the patient and their family for what to expect psychosocially and to make sure that their expectations for surgery are realistic and with that, I liaise quite closely with our surgeons, with our epileptologists um, and our psychiatrists in some cases. Um, and then after surgery, we have the benefit that at our program and that some others across Melbourne, that we have quite intensive psychosocial follow-up after surgery. So I'll see patients um, sort of around six weeks post-discharge and then I see them at least at three, six, 12 and 24 months after surgery and more often as, as required. Um, and so in these sessions, what I'm doing is prior to surgery, I'm making sure that they're making informed decisions around what the cognitive and medical and psychosocial risks of the procedure are. And then after surgery, I'm monitoring them very closely, watching for any changes in their mood um, and and reminding them of what their goals for surgery are. And if they're struggling to achieve those goals, like returning to work or widening their social circle, then that's when I adopt psychological practices. Um, personally, I really find acceptance and commitment therapy principles to be very helpful in this regard of helping them to achieve their goals and participate how they wish to, in spite of what the barriers might be whether that's low self-consciousness from the epilepsy, the disappointment if seizures return um, and the barriers imposed by seizures. So this is the model that I take. And as Honor alludes to, the family, especially in the pre and immediately post-surgical period, are very present in those discussions so that the family is also equipped um, with enough information to support the person as best they're able to. Absolutely. Um, and so this, just as a, um, a bit of an example of what we were talking about before, uh, this was a really nice study from um, Thorbeck and colleagues uh, in Canada, I believe, in 2014. Uh, so they developed for, as part of their post-operative care uh, a specific vocational rehabilitation program. Uh, and then they compared the group of patients who had had rehab intervention post-surgery with a group of patients who hadn't had um, this sort of vocational rehab and they looked at, so on the left is um, sort of prior to surgery, how many people were employed or not employed. Uh, and then two years after surgery, had they, had they changed significantly? So a reasonable proportion uh, or the majority of patients, uh, pleasingly, were employed prior to surgery uh, and maintained employment post-surgery. Uh, but we can see here that for the rehab group, um, at least double or almost double um, numbers in the rehab group or double percentage in the rehab group moved from not employed to employed post-surgery um, and also a much smaller proportion lost employment after surgery. So they were employed pre-surgery and then not employed two years post. And for the group with the rehab intervention, 
this was much, much less likely. So it's just a nice example of, um, you know, this might not be needed for all patients, uh, but it is really important. An important part of that uh, pre-surgical evaluation and goal development to identify those patients who may need that extra assistance or sort of fostering uh, of some of these goals. Uh, and I think this is a really important, um, it's very important, as Jen was saying, to be doing a lot of this work um, early post-surgery. So to be supporting the patient through um, the early, early months and years, uh, because particularly that early two year period, sort of two to five year period even, uh, of psychosocial adjustment post-surgery is very uh, mm. crucial. Um, and this is um, a model from uh, my PhD actually, looking at some of, uh, I guess, why is that early intervention so important? Um, so basically what this shows, as I said before, I was following up patients uh, up to 20 years post-surgery. So that's the scale at the bottom. Uh, how many years were they post-operatively? Uh, and then what I did was map out when they achieved certain um, milestones, certain psychosocial milestones post-surgery. So, uh, and what kind of emerged was this bit of a gradual pattern or a gradual building in milestones. So at the top is driving, which was often achieved sort of earliest or, or patients got back to driving earliest, uh, which makes um, sense given that there's usually a um, sort of uh, regimented or a particular guideline. So, you know, they have to be 12, uh, 12 months seizure free before that's considered anyway. So that has a specific time frame to it. Um, interestingly, we can see that within this early two to five year period, there was actually a lot of relationship conflict. Um, so for some patients that also involved um, separations, uh, so divorce or separation from their partners. Um, and that is really, again, the, the importance of including the family in that team, because it's not just an adjustment for the patient in how their, their psychosocial function changes without seizures, but that's also an adjustment for the family. You know, going back to those family maps that Jen was talking about, if they've been an extremely close, extremely supportive family uh, prior to surgery, and then suddenly this person uh, no longer has seizures, wants to get back to driving, wants to be more independent, wants to explore things for themselves, that's also an adjustment for the family who's been very much um, sort of supporting them and doing a lot of that for them. Um, and so there's a change in role and a change in dynamics which can cause uh, conflict for some mm. families. Um, so alongside that, there was sort of early furthering education and early uh, increased vocational gains. Um, and then moving along, so down the sort of second bottom, the bottom two, we can see that new partners, um, and for, so for patients who were single at surgery, um, marrying new partners or establishing new relationships and having their first child typically occurred sort of on average 10 years post-surgery. So again, if we're thinking about some of these complex psychosocial um, sort of milestones, as we were saying before, you know, a lot of patients will say pre-surgery, I want to date or I want a new partner or I, you know, I want to get married. Um, but it's not just the seizures themselves that might have been precluding that. It's the fact that the seizures have restricted them from dating and socialising and developing some of that self-esteem and self-efficacy and social skills. Um, and that actually takes uh, a lot of time to develop. Um, but is then, yeah, obviously a, a great area for possible intervention and support um, mm. from our end. Um, there's also, won't go into this too much, but also I think important to point out a lot of benefits for us mm. as well as clinicians to be working in a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary team. So it's a lot more, um, well, you know, I think we've certainly found it a lot more kind of motivating mm. uh, and engaging to know that you're supported um, by the team and to know that you're playing a crucial role um, in the team process. Um, and it's also very interesting mm. and there's a lot of opportunity for um, professional growth and development, learning mm. from the other members of your team. Mm. And I think mm. it's, you know, not speaking outside our bounds to say that, you know, the feedback we've gotten working 
you know, we work really closely with the epileptologists and the psychiatrists, and I, it definitely seems to be bilateral that they really enjoy he hearing our psychosocial formulations and working with us to deliver information to the patients from a medical perspective as well. Um, just to conclude, um, hopefully we've sold you on the benefits of providing a psychosocial service to people with epilepsy, but just in case the final points we wanted to make, um, you know, there is research that this works and has lots of benefits. So patients that have <clears throat> are supported to improve their social skills, their psychological functioning and their psychological resilience have improved medication adherence. So, and that's based on serum levels as well, not just self-report. They report that they're better at self-managing their epilepsy. They've improved mood and well-being. Um, they have reduced epilepsy-related anxiety after detailed psychoeducation and work on the stigma around epilepsy. Um, there's reductions in seizure frequency um, and healthcare utilisation, so those cost benefits that we mentioned earlier. When people are better controlled, when they're feeling good about themselves, they're less likely to be presenting to hospital and um, being an, um, an, a, a, with the attendant economic burdens. They also report an internal locus of control. So feeling more in charge and more empowered of their epilepsy. And, and, and these sort of social and psychological techniques that we work with developing in our patients with them um, often generalizes to other aspects of their functioning. So it gives them a better sense of control and mastery over their epilepsy, but it also generalizes to other aspects of their life as well that they feel better equipped to dealing with non-epilepsy related stress as well. Um, I'll just probably skip over that one because I'm in conscious of time, but um, we've just wanted to thank the ILE Yes webinar team who've done an amazing job um, that, um, of, of conducting and organising these. So we felt really honoured to be asked and um, in particular Pablo who invited us specifically. Um, thanks to Eliza who helped us with making some of the slides look pretty. Um, and then our mentors, particularly, we have many great mentors in our life, but particularly Sarah Wilson and Anne McIntosh have been um, really guiding lights for us in terms of developing the psychosocial approach. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge the funding of the Australian Epilepsy Research Fund for us. Um, so some references for those that are interested. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Manuela and, mm -hmm. and the whole webinar team. Yep, absolutely. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. It was very comprehensive. I actually learned a lot. And there are some questions that um, the audience has, has done, and I would like to share them with you. Uh, should all patients with epilepsy go to family therapy cons consultation, or at least a psychosocial screening to decide if they should go in order to improve their quality of life? Mm, interesting. Um, um, the way that we operate is that the epileptologists or the neurologists are really the gatekeeper of this. So we work really closely with them and we, as a team, encourage the family members to come along to appointments. And then the epileptologist really <coughs> screens clinically whether they think the family is struggling or needs extra support, and then they refer to us, I think is how we do it. Um, so in that way, everyone is kind of getting screened by the neurologists or the epileptologists. In that case, I think we don't know how to do that screening. I'm talking about my personal experience uh, as a clinician. What do you think are some tips that clinicians should know regarding like knowing when the family has a dysfunction and where the patient is struggling in that aspect? Mm. I mean, I think it, there could be a few things to look out for. I think, as Jen was saying, um, things that improve self-management particularly is psychoeducation. So the opportunity, um, and I know it, it can be difficult because certainly as the epileptologist, you often don't have as much time um, as the psychologist might with the patient and the family. So if, if the family or the, the patient is showing a very poor understanding um, of their epilepsy um, and maybe they just need even one session or a few sessions um, with 
the psychologist or the epilepsy nurse to talk through that. Mm. Um, potentially if the patient uh, or their family is showing um, heightened distress or stress um, about the person's seizures that maybe doesn't match how severe you think it is. Mm. So if you feel like the person's epilepsy is actually reasonably well managed um, and they're not having very frequent seizures, but the family is very, very anxious about it and very protective mm. and there's a bit of a, mm. an imbalance, um, then that might be a, a bit of a flag mm. that they need a bit more support and education. Mm. Um, I think other flags too, if you never see the family, sometimes can be a red flag. Um, you know, who is supporting this person when they're not coming to appointments, um, especially in the newly diagnosed phase. Um, and I think and obviously to patients with IDs, um, intellectual disability, <coughs> I always kind of like to know who's supporting them in terms of the family and if they're well supported enough. Perfect. Another question. What kind of strategies can be used to enhance social interactions and social comfortness uh, among people with epilepsy? What can they do to feel more comfortable in society? I mean, I think, again, looking at that biopsychosocial approach, I think there's, there's a few different things that can help. So, I mean, on the personal level, so for the in the middle for that person, um, it might be if they've developed a significant anxiety around their seizures or a significant social anxiety, then psychological therapy and treatment is probably the best uh, approach, I would say, on that front. Um, obviously, from the biological side of things, you know, ensuring that they're on the right medication and that, and that they've got best control of their seizures is also very helpful. Um, but exactly as, as, you know, you've been doing, Manuela, and I think from that political side of things, um, I think one of Uh, certainly in the research in um, adolescence, I think, in, um, and sometimes families, uh, uh, educational programs and greater understanding mm. on behalf of families and peer groups mm. um, is actually hugely beneficial for the person with epilepsy. So, you know, we know from a lot of the stigma models that, stig you know, at the heart of stigma is misunderstanding mm. um, and mis misinformation about epilepsy. Um, so, you know, I think the more that we can do uh, in the advocacy role to improve understanding of epilepsy um, goes a, a huge uh, long way to improving that ability to, or that comfort in interacting. And, and to pick up on what you said too about peer groups can often be really important. You know, sometimes we link in patients with someone we know that's gone through something similar. And that can be a great comfort in normalizing for the person with epilepsy um, what they can achieve despite their illness um, and, and a bit of a role model for how to navigate living with epilepsy. Perfect. Um, how soon are the neuropsychologists brought into ca the care of people with epilepsy? The role is critical and will help patients to understand epilepsy from day one. Mm. Ah, oh, great. I think in, in ideal land with unlimited funding, <laughs> we would be, we would love to be there around the first seizure clinics and helping provide psychoeducation intervention then. We, we don't do that at the moment. There's not the funding, um, but that's ideally where we would like to be. Um, at the moment, uh, we are involved in... Um, Basically, wherever referred, um, you know, uh, for cognitive assessments, uh, if people have subjective concerns, if they're struggling at work or school and they need an educational assessment, um, pre-surgery, obviously, um, the worried patients who are worried about their, their cognition. Um, and then from a psychosocial point of view, it's similar, you know, um, wherever the, our, our colleagues detect that someone's struggling Um, we'll meet with them. It might only be a one-off session where we just talk to them, we validate their experience and that they're doing a great job. Um, sometimes people just kind of need to hear that. But And then for a lot of patients, you know, we do a clinical formulation and then we we'll aim to work with them sort of over the long term from a rehabilitation perspective. It's mandatory in our centres um, that they have neuropsych 
around surgery though. So whether they like it or not, they're stuck with me for about two to three years around epilepsy surgery. Mm. I'm the same with honor. Yeah. And I think also one thing to, to think about is um, the benefits of that interdisciplinary team. So if there is reduced funding and reduced ability for, for us to see you know, everyone, which mm. would, would be nice, but you know, I know in our, in Alfred, in our team, the epilepsy nurse specialist also plays a huge role in early psychoeducation mm. of the patient and the family. Um, and she'll do a lot to connect them with community organisations like the Epilepsy Foundation or Epilepsy Action, uh, those sorts of groups if they need, um, if, they, if, if what's sort of needed is just that little bit more information and support, um, if that's sufficient. And then if, you know, she feels like they're, they're actually really struggling or more complex, um, then that's when the referral might mm. get triggered to us or to the neuropsychiatrist. Um, so really, yeah, using the whole team and everyone's strengths to make sure we're trying to pick up everyone. Mm. Another question is uh, psychologists and neuropsychologists in many of our countries have no specific training on epilepsy care. Which resources or courses would you recommend for, for them to improve that aspect of care? I think this webinar is a great start um, and other webinars in the series. Um, um, I know the ILE um, occasionally runs a neuropsychology summer school um, where you go away somewhere fabulous for a week and there are bursaries available. It's heavily subsidised by the ILAE um, and you do an intensive week about caring for people with epilepsy from a neuropsychological perspective. So I'd keep my eyes peeled for that. Um, and the Congresses too, I think, are increasingly having um, re greater recognition of the comorbidities of epilepsy and how to treat them. So in my experience of going to the regional and international Congresses and even our, and especially our national chapter, um, you know, has been there's been lots of great learning opportunities and internships and things if you're able, if you have access or, or are able to organise those. Yeah. And I think... Um, yeah. Within the, the YES group, I know Jen started like a neuropsychology stream and, you know, even just to sort of share papers and share ideas or, mm. um, you know, that sort of thing I think is always very beneficial. Yeah, we, that's true. We did, we, we it's, it's on hiatus for the last few months, but we do have a clinical practice and epilepsy neuropsychology group where we meet on Zoom and we talk about cases about once every six weeks and that's open to anyone across the world. Um, sometimes it's tricky with time zones, but, yeah. Anyone is welcome. So please email me if you're interested. Great. Um, really important points. Psychosocial ill health have been documented as high in many chronic conditions, including epilepsy, raising questions about the way in which societies frame the issue, uh, frame the issue of disability more widely. How do you envis envisage the role of neuropsychologists to improve to improve or modify the way society sees people with epilepsy? That was a, yeah. that was a good question. Mm -hmm. um, I think that speaks very much um, to what Jen was talking about on that political level, so that outermost uh, ring of the biopsychosocial model. Um, and similar to, to what you've been doing as well, Manuela, as we were saying, you know, the role of advocacy um, is huge. And I think that's where it's really important for us to connect with community mm. organizations such as yeah epilepsy action epilepsy mm. uk epilepsy foundation mm. us and australia mm. um you know to give talks potentially mm. um you know i know um jen and i've worked a lot with some of the community organizations here to to sort of talk to the um, client services workers so they're the mm. people who receive calls just from anyone with epilepsy in the community with all sorts of random questions um, and so, you know, if we can help educate them and work with them, then that improves their support of people in, with epilepsy in the community, um, mm. that sort of thing. So working closely with community organisations, uh, I think, can have a huge um, uh, benefit, just particularly to educate more broadly on things like the cognitive and psychosocial comorbidities mm. um, rather than, yeah, not just, but rather than to focusing specifically on the seizures and uh, medical management. And I think something I'm really passionate about too is getting more neuropsychologists involved in epilepsy advocacy. Mm. I think um, we've historically left it to our neurology colleagues, um, but it's something that we can 
with more, um, you know, like you can, you can get involved, you know, through YES or through the ILEE, there's always opportunity to be involved in advocacy. And um, I think we could play a huge role with more numbers of us getting involved in the YES and ILEE and things like that. Mm. Absolutely. Perfect. One more question. What is your opinion about subjective self-report questionnaires to understand the neuropsychological or neuropsychosocial problems of people with epilepsy? Yeah, I think they definitely have a place. Um, we use screening questionnaires um, in our video monitoring unit. Everyone gets ones on depression and anxiety while they're in having monitoring um, and a cognitive screen and a whole bunch of other psychological screens. And they just really, they don't replace an intensive interview, of course, but they flag people who then can be referred. So I think they play an important role in um, smart healthcare utilisation and a smart utilisation of resources of a screening tool to just flag who needs more input. I think they've been, and increasingly there's epilepsy specific tools. So the nitty for depression, um, the breezy or the easy um, for anxiety, um, amongst others. So I think we're in a good position to do to use those tools to our advantage and to maximise the scarce resources that we do have, for sure. There is a follow-up to this question and is uh, particularly considering patients with temporal lobe epilepsy who sometimes are not adequately aware of what uh, their own neuropsychological impairments. Do these uh, tests really work on these patients who tend to have a little bit of agnosia? Yeah, or, that's a great point. I mean, I think it's sort Probably of, not. yeah, <laughs> uh, I guess it depends on the questionnaires you're, you're sort of asking about mm. in terms of um, certainly with cognitive um, difficulties or with cognitive deficits, like a, a formal objective cognitive assessment would be needed or would be helpful. Um, and, you know, we know from, from anyone with epilepsy, not just TLE, that actually mood um, mm. factors are a greater predictor of subjective cognitive complaints. So if you're basing it purely on the person's report or self-report of their memory or their attention, um, it might be there might be other factors there like mood um, that you need to uh, disentangle. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, our recommendation is anyone that's complaining about their cognition should probably get a neuropsychology test. Now, at our centre, we don't do eight or 10 hour long batteries like I know some um, centres do. Um, our assessments take two hours and they're very hypothesis driven. So we're able to probably see a greater number of patients because of that. But yeah, anyone that's complaining about their memory gets referred for a neuropsychological screen or with us, a clinical assessment or a diagnostic assessment. And sometimes we don't even do tests. We might meet someone and chat with them for an hour and, you know, it becomes apparent that it's actually they're projecting psychological distress um, rather than any cognitive issues. Um, and I would also acknowledge that there's work being done to improve cognitive screens for use of people with epilepsy. So I know there's some work being done here in Melbourne, but also Christoph Helmstetter and Epitrack. Um, and there's a few others out there that have been specifically developed to try and get around some of these issues that I think maybe the person asking is getting at, but historically it hasn't, they haven't been great. One last question that just arrived. What type of long-term monitoring, if you want to boundlessly wish for, for do you imagine would help you? Uh, what type of signals and modalities would be of interest to you? I, uh, I guess the question is more referred to like, how long-term monitoring would help uh, patients with epilepsy and their care? Hmm. Is that specifically post-surgery or just in general, um, do you think? Mm. I mean, I guess to say, so post-surgery, um, there's been a really good, I think <coughs> Sally Baxendale and Sarah Wilson and the neuropsychology task force from the ILA put out some really great um sort of recommendations or considerations for neuropsychology pre and post operatively. Uh, and as sort of similar to what Jen was saying before, they have sort of suggested that two to five years post-surgery is really the sort of time frame to see a lot of um, 
quality of life and psychosocial benefits, as well as cognitive, um, the cognitive trajectory, at least two years, I would say, is a good time frame just to sort of monitor any changes. Um, and so that's a, probably a good time frame clinically. Mm. Not all patients would necessarily need that, just mm. as a note. You know, mm. some patients do kind of similar to that group from Thorbeck study who were employed pre and employed post and just mm. um, obviously kind of carried on. Um, so not all patients will need that. Um, but within the Alfred's program, you know, at least two years is a good I would say is a good follow-up time frame. Yeah. Um, and then maybe some might need a little bit yeah. further, um, but others won't. Mm. Yeah, two to five years. Perfect. Okay, with this, we conclude our webinar for today. It was wonderful having you both uh, here with us, and I hope we get a chance to see you all again in another opportunity. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you.